you to another session in this series that the Wilson Center is doing in partnership with the National History Center, uh, bringing historians to the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is, as many of you know, a, mem a living memorial to President Wilson, and in honor of his life and in trying to parallel his life, we try to bring together people who are scholars with people who are policymakers and have discussions that are relevant to both of those groups. And this series is very much in that spirit, a little more on the academic side than some of our other events, but we're very grateful to the National History Center for making this possible. So I'd like to now turn this over to Roger Lewis, who is head of the National History Center, who will introduce this afternoon's speaker. Uh, I will introduce uh, this afternoon's speaker, but uh, this has become a sort of ritual. If everyone would introduce himself, herself, just going around the table, your, your name and your uh, affiliation, if any. Not to worry if you don't have a, an affiliation. It's my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Bruce Cummings, who, as I believe all of you know, is a distinguished uh, service uh, professor at the University uh, of uh, Chicago. I don't believe I'm giving away any secrets by saying that Bruce began his postgraduate career as a Peace Corps member in Korea. Uh, this led on to a famous, I won't say revolutionary, but quite original, uh, two volumes on Korea, one of which won the John K. Fairbank, one of the most prestigious of the AHA awards, and the other, uh, the Quincy Wright Award, which is almost as distinguished. Uh, Quincy Wright was the panjandrum of international law and international uh, uh, studies. Uh, Bruce has very recently published his new book, uh, which is called Dominion from Sea to Sea, Pacific Ascendancy and American Power. And you see the uh, jacket, is this the front jacket or the front, the, front of the, jacket. the front of the jacket there on the screen? Uh, I want, wanted to mention that we usually discourage uh, PowerPoint. Uh, because PowerPoint becomes a kind of crutch uh, for people who can't sustain an argument and they go from one point to the other. That, that's what but I'm we have do. confidence <laughs> in Bruce Cummings. I also wanted to say uh, that uh, he is widely known for having uh, received uh, 
a MacArthur Award, but it is a matter of some controversy, and he will only himself know whether this was the Genius Award or the other type of... Uh, <laughs> the other type. Uh, the other type. <laughs> I, can see, I, I can see either way that it's a real problem. You either have to confess to being a genius or you have to admit that you're not a uh, genius. Uh, I just want to reassure you, Bruce, that there are some in the audience, perhaps not all, but some who truly believe that your work is uh, a work of genius. Well, thank you so much, Roger. That's, that's a wonderful introduction. I, I had only a one-year uh, MacArthur back in 1990-91, and uh, certainly not a genius award, but there's always hope. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, want to <coughs> introduce my book to you. Uh, some of you perhaps would have read it, uh, but I didn't want to give a lecture on it. I, I thought I would uh, show you some of the slides uh, and uh, murals that Yale University Press made me pay for, or they wouldn't publish them. Uh, but I think uh, I was very happy to do it because I think it, it makes a big difference in the book. This, of course, is John Gast's uh, mural from the early 1870s, uh, essentially uh, showing a maiden in, in a rather diaphanous gown facing west. And if uh, Walt Whitman and historian Richard Drennan had not used that title, uh, I would have used it. That would have been the title of, of this book because that's what it's about. It, it's really about uh, America from the early 19th century to the present, uh, emphasizing the modal 19th century stance toward the rest of the world, which was a back turn to Europe, uh, expansionism through the continent, and then rather quickly uh, to Japan uh, with Perry's visit, uh, the China with the uh, China market, and so on. Uh, what I wanted to do, particularly for the academics who are present, is to try and join two fields that in my career I've always thought should be joined but were largely separate, and that would be the history of the American West and the history of America in the Pacific. Uh, the Western historians uh, have produced uh, wonderful literature, but they don't really get their feet wet in the Pacific Ocean. That's for dip diplomatic historians or somebody else to do. And yet, uh, I must say also, I, I, this is parenthetical, I should apologize to those who came to hear something about Korea today, uh, because my book isn't really uh, much about uh, Korea at, at all. But the optic that I developed uh, in over 40 years since I went to the Peace Corps really is, makes Korea indispensable in that I saw <laughs> the U.S. from a very different perspective uh, than if I had uh, gone to the Peace Corps in France, had they had a Peace Corps in France. Uh, and I, I felt that what I later learned in graduate school about American foreign relations, uh, the Atlanticism, internationalism, multilateralism, uh, that so characterizes our diplomacy since 1941 in Europe uh, didn't really characterize it in East Asia, and particularly the, the lack of alphabet soup uh, organizations in East Asia like the EU or NATO or any number of others uh, that exist in Europe but not in Asia uh, is, is part of the motivation uh, for this book. So uh, my optic, which really in a sense discovered the world by studying Korea, which I really believe is true, uh, is, uh, is at the basis of this book. So it's about uh, a pacificist orientation in American foreign policy, but I, I can't say that as opposed to Atlanticism because it's a synonym for pacifism uh, if you look it up in uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, but that really is what I wanted to do. I wanted to take as far as I could the idea that our Pacific involvements have been uh, different and, and yield a, a different uh, understanding of America's relationship to the world uh, than our, our European involvements, uh, at least those since 1941. Some of what I cover in the book, uh, I think, almost makes it read like a textbook for a, a historian of the American West. I mean, someone who knows a lot about the war with Mexico uh, would know that as soon as it was over, almost, w uh, people began thinking of crossing the Pacific. Uh, and uh, in 1853, Commodore Perry was in uh, Japan, uh, moving his ships ever closer to the emperor. Uh, and when he finally got an audience with high Japanese officials, he reminded them that American troops had been in downtown Mexico City uh, not so long ago. So for uh, an American historian of the West, 
these are obvious follow-ons. For me, for much of my career, uh, American history in East Asia began with Perry's visit, and I didn't know much at all about the Mexican War. So I, I did a lot of reading, uh, but uh, I think much of what I have to say about the history of the West is not so new. What I hope is, is newer is uh, the political economy that lies at the basis of my book, symbolized by the woman in question here uh, carrying a telegraph in her left hand, uh, barely visible, a telegraph wire. Uh, the more I learned about the telegraph, uh, the less I came to see what's happened in Silicon Valley in the last 60 years as, as a terrific major revolution. It's been extremely important, but when it takes uh, two weeks for uh, Andrew Jackson to get to Washington for his inauguration from Tennessee, and it takes seven seconds for anything in the world to be telegraphed around the world after the telegraph is invented in the 1840s. It, it, it just shrank the world uh, in a truly revolutionary way. But as far as the political economy of, of the West, uh, that's where I try to begin. And, and I conclude with the penultimate chapter on, on Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a rather long chapter. I learned a great deal about Silicon Valley, and particularly its deep history. Uh, going back uh, really to 1908 or 09 when uh, entrepreneurs began the process of getting together with Stanford and new technologies, in that case radio, uh, and working with the federal government in World War I on radio uh, and various other things. It really began a pattern uh, that uh, got an enormous boost in uh, World War II and the Korean War and that continues right down uh, to today of a great university working with entrepreneurs uh, and the federal government to found what is still, I think, unquestionably uh, the leading uh, sector in the world economy. And, and that, of course, leads me to a major conclusion in the book, which is that the American century, which many people think ended in 2000, uh, I argue began around 1941 uh, with Pearl Harbor being the key tipping point of uh, Henry Luce's essay being a, a, an essay looking to the future, uh, and that Americans really don't have much to worry about in terms of their global leadership until the middle of the century we're in right now. And uh, I was done with my book right at the time the financial crash happened in October, September 2008, and my editors urged me to revise. And I just said, calm down, calm down. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and I have maybe two sentences uh, uh, relating to it. But uh, anyway, let me start moving a little bit through this presentation. Some things I'm going to skip over uh, rather quickly, and, but you may want to note them, and, and we can have a discussion later. Uh, this, of course, is a, a cultural Pacific. Uh, it's what New Yorkers think about the continent. Uh, you fly over it, and if you're Woody Allen, sometimes you have to go to Hollywood and L.A., but you don't really like it and you want to get back as fast as possible. Uh, and my reading for this book taught me, if I didn't understand before, that power uh, in the United States still resides in the Washington-New York nexus or corridor, cultural power in New York, uh, real power uh, centered in Washington. Uh, great universities like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, peppering uh, the East Coast, uh, and the West Coast and the Pacific have not even begun to develop a counter to this. Uh, people talked about it in the 70s with Kirkpatrick Sales' uh, book on uh, power shift, uh, and certainly uh, some kinds of power, especially political economy, have shifted to the West Coast. But when you realize that uh, at least a couple of years ago, the LA Times was edited by people who used to edit the New Republic and the New York Times, uh, that the Atlantic Monthly is still a major magazine and that there's no Pacific Monthly that has any weight to there. I think there is a Pacific Monthly, but uh, it's not at all like the Atlantic Monthly. And above all, when you look at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Massachusetts Avenue, where you have uh, Brookings across the street from Sice, and uh, the Peterson Institute, and so on, you realize, I realize myself, even as a Chicagoan, let alone someone from the West Coast, I realize myself at the center of the world uh, in terms of, of the ideas that uh, activate America's relationship to the world and American foreign policy. So uh, I st still think, and I argue in the book, that the, 
California, especially in the Pacific more generally, have not begun uh, to erode the cultural hegemony uh, of the northeast part of the United States. One of the first reviews of my book accused me of having yet another account of American exceptionalism. And what I did was quote Marx on American exceptionalism. Uh, this is from, it's a little known essay. I say little known because I mentioned it to Christopher Hitchens and he hadn't heard of it. And if there's anything Christopher Hitchens hasn't heard of, then he would think it's little known. <laughs> uh, it's an essay, essay about uh, French economist Bastiat and famous American 19th century economist Henry Carey, Carey being a protectionist, Bastiat being a free trader. It's a really brilliant uh, essay, short little essay. Uh, when I do a PowerPoint, I, I assume people in the audience are literate, so I don't read it to them. Uh, but he takes the continent of the United States to be exceptional, uh, that the productive forces of the old world can be instantly applied to the natural and enormous terrain uh, of this new world. Uh, and that the state, meaning the government in Washington, the federal government, was just a shadow of European states, it couldn't even make a pretense of itself. I would say it still can't make a pretense of itself, uh, even though <coughs> it would like to. Uh, he's thinking of Prussia and France and places like that. Uh, in the mid-19th century, that's an 1857 essay when uh, there were no sewers in Washington and wild pigs and dogs and everything were running through the streets. So it's not surprising that he should think that, but it's a very, I think, a very important statement. And it's the kind of ur text, in my view, for Lewis Hartz's famous formulations in the liberal uh, tradition in America. Uh, that book is also seen as a a text in, of American exceptionalism, but when you, I think, read it carefully, uh, what you get is a, a person fully uh, educated in a European sense, even though he grew up in Omaha, uh, uh, Lewis Hartz, who was looking at this country from a comparative standpoint, comparing it to Europe and finding it very different. Above all, no feudal formation. Uh, slaves in the South, uh, of course, have to be considered, but not in my book, because this is an east-west book and not a north-south one. Uh, and because there was no feudalism and no peasantry, there can be no socialism, uh, which uh, is Hartz's point, but Marx makes it right at the end there. The antitheses of bourgeois society appear only as vanishing moments. So you have an old left, a new left, no left, uh, a left that is not rooted in this country. Again, these are comparative judgments. They're not judgments saying there was no class conflict in this country or that slavery didn't make a difference, but rather what does this country look like compared to uh, Europe. The other major theme uh, is from the other Marx, uh, Leo Marx, uh, who still teaches at MIT, who wrote uh, a book I've always liked called The Machine in the Garden, uh, which is a, a New England book. It's about New England and Thoreau and all of that, but he uh, talks about the way in which for Thoreau the, rail, the railway uh, disturbed his uh, pastoral uh, <coughs> idols. And what I argue is that beginning with the development of Chicago uh, as a, a major industrial city, uh, American dreams of, of this continent as a virgin continent, an Arcadia that could turn into a utopia, were constantly uh, ground under uh, so that uh, ideal dreams and, and uh, myths about the United States were constantly undone by the enormous uh, <coughs> and rapid uh, growth of productive forces uh, in which Chicago distinguishes itself uh, by being the central city of the second industrial revolution, iron, steel, railways, and so on. <coughs> what Marx argues in his book, Leo Marx, is that people resist this, they uh, try to think this is not their country, and then they discover it is their country, and they, they have an encounter with wildness or radicalism or something different, and then they return to the grid of American industrial life symbolized by the grid of the streets in, in Chicago. So uh, what I go on to say is that Leo Marx said this in 1964, but you can see uh, Frederick Jackson Turner saying it around the turn of the century and for the next 10 years, 
uh, where his frontier idea is constantly, uh, in his own mind, being challenged by the enormous industrial combine that is developed in the Midwest and that seems to dash his, his dreams. And of course, the book has a major concern with California. I mean, someone said, how come you pay so much attention to California? This is an East Coaster. I said, if California encompassed Boston, New York, and Washington, uh, and was uh, the size of Italy or larger uh, in terms of GDP, you'd pay attention to it, too. Uh, it, it is uh, an amazing state that from its inception uh, after the gold rush right down to the present has, has been our own private Italy, uh, the kind of leading sector state uh, in the economy. And even though it's uh, had some doldrums lately, uh, mainly because of the inability to tax its citizens, uh, it, it remains uh, at the forefront of American economic power and technological development. Now, I, I list some recent titles, and I have fun with these titles in the book. Uh, would you ever find a book called Paradise Lost, Indiana, uh, or Coast of Dreams, New Jersey? In fact, uh, New Jersey has a pretty nice coast. I used to go to it in high school, and Indiana was seen uh, just as all the rest of the continent was seen as a virgin paradise uh, when it first became a state. Uh, but they've all given up on that. <laughs> and California hasn't, and I guess that's the point I want to make. California still is poised between uh, a lost Arcadia and a future utopia it's never going to find. Uh, this, of course, is our familiar continent, and it has the characteristic of being arid uh, west of the 98th meridian. Uh, the aridity, uh, the onset of aridity in Texas is almost exactly where Lyndon Johnson grew up on the Pedernales River, uh, and that's why his family and so many other families failed. Uh, but I'm not really interested in, in, in going back over the history of the arid far west except uh, to talk about water and power. Uh, which I have a separate chapter on uh, and which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, another thing about California is that nobody could find it. Uh, this is uh, a 1616 map that shows California as an enormous island, not part of the continent. Uh, there you see uh, it up close. It's like the joke about the different people feeling different parts of an elephant. Uh, the Spanish were feeling uh, what they thought was the tail of an island uh, on the Baja Peninsula. But California was much more forbidding than I realized when I began my research in terms of you know, how hard it was uh, to cross by land from Mexico City to Southern California. It took months, and it was dangerous. And then it wasn't all that easy either uh, uh, by ship. Uh, Junipero uh, Serra, the first uh, father who made that voyage, uh, that trip, and began with his colleagues to set up missions all along the coast. They sent three uh, ships north. Uh, father Serra went by foot, and one of the ships foundered entirely. The crew of the second one died uh, of scurvy and various other illnesses. Most of them died. And then when they land, they find it very hard to go inland, not because there are Indians protecting uh, the coast, uh, but just because it seems to go on forever when you get over the uh, foothill mountains uh, and, and then you reach the Rockies. I mean, that's a very <laughs> truncated story of what I have to say in the book. But the point is that for 250 uh, years of the modern world, if you date the modern world from Columbus's uh, voyage to the gold rush, people didn't know where California was or what it was for a long time. I'm sorry, John Speed's map is 1626, not 1616. Uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, Jefferson, of course, sent Lewis and Clark hastening off to find out what he had purchased, and they went all the way to the Oregon coast uh, in 1805-06 uh, and discovered uh, the continental dimensions of the northern part of the United States. But even then, it was as late as the 1830s, people didn't understand the continental 3,000-mile dimension of the U.S., including cartographers uh, who would uh, show the Rockies in Kansas and things like that. <coughs> so it really uh, was in the 1830s that maps began to appear that joined California to the continent, and the full continent was known. 
And then after the gold rush, when California was instantly peopled, uh, you have California at the cutting edge of uh, just about everything thereafter. Uh, mechanized wheat production with gigantic combines in the 1880s, a huge citrus industry, huge oil industry, autos caught on there faster than any place else, Suburb suburbanization in the 20s, uh, where it was mostly in the 50s elsewhere. Uh, so it's, uh, as I said, like having our own private Italy. Uh, I have some fun uh, in a chapter called uh, A Continent in Five Easy Pieces, uh, talking about how this continent was put together, and I don't want to dwell on it, but the 13 colonies were the first piece. The Louisiana Purchase was just unbelievable when you look at its dimensions. It's uh, a third of, of the continent, and nobody knew that they hadn't just purchased the Orleans Territory, but had purchased uh, a third of the continent, $15 million for a wonderful day in April in Paris. And then uh, Polk's War with Mexico in 1846 brings in uh, California and Texas. There's Polk, I think a completely underestimated president. Uh, I call him the Bismarck of America. Uh, but in any case, he brought California into the Union, and independent Texas also joined the Union. He was also a one-term president, who one of the only ones who decided to retire after just one term. There you see the dimensions of the territory that Polk brought into uh, the United States. Here's another look at it. These are very familiar things, and I, I don't want to take too much time with them. Uh, as soon as Polk brings together the continent, uh, people like Perry start thinking about the Pacific and going to Japan, as I said earlier. Uh, and, and of course, Seward brings in Alaska, Seward's folly. But when you look at the North Pacific, uh, Alaska makes a, a strategic cap on the North Pacific that is <coughs> remarkable. Uh, not so much recognized at the time, but uh, by World War II, it was absolutely critical, and, and of course, during the Cold War. And then the Hawaiian Islands uh, are just uh, due south in the middle uh, of the North Pacific and uh, are the seat of sink pack and uh, really the greatest uh, display and deployment of military power in the world and, and that the world uh, has it ever seen. So this all happens in the mid-19th century. I say at the beginning of the book that one of my favorite films has always been Chinatown and that I saw it while I was uh, waiting to defend my dissertation, having nothing better to do. In 1974, I went into a $2 theater on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. I, I was at Columbia. Uh, and I stayed on for a second uh, viewing which I had never done before, because the film, uh, first of all, is hard to understand, and second of all, it seemed to have an understanding of the relationship between the American West and water on the one hand, and the American <coughs> West and China on the other, that was remarkable. Uh, China, of course, appears as Chinatown, where all the vices that white Americans associated with Chinatown come into play, uh, Tong Wars, mayhem, uh, one vice after another, even incest. Uh, and then Roman Polanski, who has his own California history, as we all know, uh, turns that around and makes it the worldview of the WASP elite that ran Los Angeles like uh, uh, its own country club for uh, many, many decades until the 1960s. Uh, Noah Cross, uh, Noah is water, Cross uh, presumably is Christ, uh, is played by John Huston, and he's the most evil person in the film but we don't learn that really until the end of it. Uh, I thought that juxtaposition uh, was remarkable. Uh, and when you look at the aqueduct that is at the basis of, of the story in the film of the founding of Los Angeles, the aqueduct that was opened in 1913, bringing the Owens Lake to Los Angeles, uh, then you get uh, another Chinese theme, uh, otherwise known as the theory of oriental despotism, the idea that, uh, Karl Wittfogel's idea that Chinese emperors deployed enormous power by uh, changing the course of rivers, deploying water, using mass labor, uh, and between the ruling elite and the mass below, there was no middle class ever developing, no commerce and so on. It's not right as a theory of, of China, but it's a very influential theory, particularly when I was a graduate student. We had Wittfogel in my seminar one day. 
Uh, and it's what happened in California uh, in that uh, the city fathers brought water to LA, enough to get two million people watered when the city had uh, about 200 or 300,000, but always with an eye to the future. Now, this book by Stephen Erie was published in 2006, and it shows you the degree to which a, a, a film, namely Chinatown, has created an entire genre of literature. Uh, there's a very good book by uh, an historian named Carl, I'm blanking on his first name right now, called Water and Power that I think is the best historical account of what you need to do to take a desert and make it bloom. Uh, but Rivers of Empire by Donald Worcester is probably the most influential uh, book in this genre because he argued that there's an empire controlled from Washington out in the West. It's a water empire. Uh, it makes deals with the local people. It's extremely uh, powerful. Uh, and that empire, he goes on to argue, is the seat of the American empire uh, on a global scale. Technological control of water was the basis of the New West. Uh, this is the antithesis of Turner's uh, democratic frontier society. A modern hydraulic society based on the ownership of capital and expertise by a power elite. I actually think that Worcester has fairly well described the Western water empire, although most Westerners don't see it in the negative light that he does. And neither did Franklin Roosevelt when he built the Grand Coulee Dam, uh, or various folk singers who sang the praises at the time, uh, like Woody Guthrie, of bringing cheap water uh, to people. But I think he's wrong um, that this is the seat of the American empire. I think uh, you could still have America's position in the world without this water empire. I argue in one chapter in the book that if we have an empire, it's an archipelago of military bases around the world, 750 plus military bases, uh, because it seems to me that a definition of empire has to have a territorial component. If it doesn't have a territorial component, that it's an informal empire or an open door or something like that, uh, we can get to my definition of an empire in a minute, but I, I think that's what's wrong with Worcester's book. Now, this is a detailed slide, but most of you would know what happened. Uh, November 22nd is when the Japanese attack fleet left the Kurile chain to attack Pearl Harbor. And in World War II, the West Coast was transformed. It's very important for my argument to understand that you had a few modestly industrial cities on the West Coast, Oakland, perhaps was the primary one. Los Angeles was not industrial. San Francisco, Seattle had Boeing, but it was a very small firm before World War II. Portland had almost no industry. It was a lumber uh, processing uh, city with a lumber exporting state. And with the New Deal, but above all with, with World War II, you have Roosevelt presiding over the industrialization of the West Coast state-founded uh, industries one after another, aircraft, uh, aerospace, aluminum, magnesium, and ab above all, nuclear, the, by far the most expensive Western industry uh, at Hanford in Washington, at Los Alamos and other places. Uh, and, and that uh, created a, a corporate structure of the state, corporations, public works, and uh, that just hadn't existed in this country before. Or if it existed, it's first, we first glimpse it with the Hoover Dam and the six companies that built the Hoover Dam. <coughs> now, Bechtel is the master corporation of this and still a privately held corporation. Uh, but what you have is the industrialization of the West Coast using the latest technologies. So when you set up an aircraft factory in LA, you use the latest technologies. When you do it in Detroit, you take the Dearborn Ford plant and you turn it over to aircraft engine or aircraft production. And when the war is over, you go back to producing Fords. Uh, there had been a couple of um, modest uh, auto factories, Studebaker and a couple of others in LA before the war. But afterwards, uh, you had uh, industries all over the place. Uh, 
the end of Anglo dominance comes with the arrival of uh, at least 100,000 African Americans uh, in, in Southern California, mostly from Texas and Arkansas to work in the factories. Uh, and then you go up the coast to Oakland and Richmond and Portland and Seattle, and the same things are going on. Now, this is in a sense a familiar story, but I think what I've tried to do in the book is to cast it in a different light of seeing the U.S. as not only the only country that has a continent open to the Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, open at both ends, so to speak, with long coasts, which is terribly important to American power, uh, but also uh, a national market that has industrial bases on, in the West, the Midwest, and, and the Northeast, and of course some in the South, like Birmingham. So you have uh, uh, the, com the completion of an industrial national market during World War II, whereas California and the West had been dependent uh, on the East for steel and autos and most of everything else. They paid uh, a Pittsburgh plus price much higher for steel than other companies did, other states did. <coughs> and then as, as I, I think I've already said enough about, and I'm only gonna talk maybe five uh, more minutes so we can have a, a good discussion. Uh, California also pioneered a, a matrix of state business and academe that actually begins with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, at Caltech, I think, uh, it, which is a much bigger deal than Stanford at the time. And then Stanford carries it on uh, right up to the present. And I have a little bit of fun a, as an academic uh, making fun of Yale and Harvard, uh, for example, who turned down proposals from high-tech firms uh, to found them uh, uh, in originally going way back, uh, or to work with the state uh, and the CIA and other agencies who were interested in, in uh, buying silicon chips and figuring out what Oracle was doing and all of that. Uh, Nostalgia East Coast universities uh, in many ways missed out on this, but Stanford has been a, a happy coupling of state business and academe since uh, really World War II, but even before it uh, in the mid-1930s. And then later on, all the universities by the 50s are doing essentially the same thing. Now, uh, this part of my talk uh, is very familiar uh, to me, anyway, in my, uh, my work over the years on the Northeast Asian political economy. Uh, when you examine Dean Acheson's idea of a great crescent stretching, stretching from Alexandria to Tokyo, bringing the oil of the Middle East to revive Japanese industry, uh, restored access to South Korea, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, uh, you have what I think to proved to be a brilliant strategy of export-led development that <coughs> continues today in China, uh, but has g migrated from Japan to South Korea and Taiwan uh, to China and Vietnam and, and of course, city-states like Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, it it uh, was interrupted, uh, that's another way to look at the Korean War, uh, by North Korea in 1950, and it, it really took 15 years to stitch South Korea's relationship uh, uh, to this political economy back together. Uh, but since for 30 years, then Korea uh, grew at the fastest rate in the world, along with Taiwan, about 9.4% for 30 years. Uh, on average, and then China has done this since 1979. It isn't that Acheson thought about all of this, it's just that, or imagined all of this, it's just that it was a strategy of political economy that gave you a very robust Northeast Asian political economy to go along with the very robust post-war uh, West Coast uh, Western economy. Now this is uh, where I talk about the archipelago of empire. Uh, I really think that you can read Roosevelt's papers and think that he did not have in mind 750 military bases around the world. In fact, he uh, would accuse the Navy in particular of trying to get bases uh, just as World War II was coming to an end. Uh, I don't think this was a planned endeavor at all. I think it was a result of two war settlements, uh, World War II uh, and Korea which had the U.S. doing something it had never done before, which is to station troops on the territory of every big industrial power, all of its allies except for France, which asked us to leave in 1967, uh, and of course China. <coughs> My most controversial statement, at least at the University of Chicago, 
with my friend John Mearsheimer holding forth would be that this basing strategy also shut down the operation of realpolitik since 1945, that we do not have uh, the bandwagoning, the ganging up, the balancing uh, the uh, realpolitik between the U.S. on the one hand and England, Germany, France, and Japan on the other that you would expect from major uh, industrial powers and that existed uh, all through the modern period before 1945. And then when you look at the Pacific, I mean, it isn't an exaggeration to say that it's an American lake. Uh, Sink Pack, uh, the command in Hawaii, believes that it surveils or uh, has under its uh, domain 52% of the Earth's surface. Uh, it's not so amazing when you go and look at it. Uh, the, the headquarters is in a kind of uh, mission-style uh, building right across from Ford Island at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but when you look at their website and books about Sink Pack, I mean, they control our troops in Korea and Japan and every place else uh, in, the, in, in Asia. So it's a, a, it's, it's a tremendous reach of military power, and nobody has been able to uh, come close to matching it since 1945. And the Soviets had a brief period of uh, trying to get a Blue Ocean Navy. Uh, and. Uh, Japan, which competed in, in the Pacific uh, very strongly with the U.S. from the mid-1890s to 1941, uh, doesn't compete at all. China still has a fundamentally a coastal uh, kind of navy with no uh, throw reach to speak of. Uh, and so one reason uh, we're going to have uh, America as a, the dominant world power into the middle of this century is I find it impossible to imagine anybody uh, raising uh, a competing force that could begin to match uh, what the U.S. does on a global scale and especially in the Pacific. There, that's a bad, I was trying to find a good map of global U.S. military bases. That's a bad one. Uh, but since that map, I think we've had a new command in Africa called AFCOM. Uh, but above all, movement into the Middle East and South Asia that, that is much larger in our time, the last decade, than anything before. There you see it again. <coughs> Finally, let me say a couple of things about uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, I've already said that it gets going well before even World War I, let alone World War II. In the interwar period, the microwave is discovered, the transistor is discovered just after World War II, uh, and the state is hugely interested in these things. In the early 60s, uh, the Pentagon bought every last silicon chip that was manufactured in Texas and California for its missile programs, uh, for the Minuteman missile. So you had uh, a sheltered market and you knew you could sell every last chip that you made to that market. And then the Pentagon would put ridiculous demands on Silicon Valley firms uh, like Intel and its predecessor. One failure in 10,000 years, one failure in a millennium was the, the goal uh, of one of the chips for the Minuteman missile, and they met it. Now, those of you that are near as old as I am remember what it was like to have tubes in your radio or TV and they would bust out, and then you'd have to go find the thread, get, open the thing up and replace the tube. Uh, th that was 1930s and 40s technology. That's where the word computer bug comes from, because the ENIAC computer, that was the first mainframe right at the end of World War II, it was brought, built uh, to do artillery trajectories. It had thousands of, of those tubes, and they would bust all the time, so they had someone going around replacing them, and that's why they called them bugs. Bugs were busting the, the tubes. Uh, that's where computer bug came from. But the silicon chip wasn't so good in the 50s, but by the 60s it was perfected uh, to do everything right all the time. And in, in my book, I try to argue that maybe this isn't a revolution like the telegraph, but it is a revolution in reliability. And we all know that from our cars. American cars used to break down reliably at about 60,000 miles, and a Toyota will go 200,000 miles if you can take care of it. So works all the time reliability came out of the nexus of Silicon Valley, <coughs> Texas Instruments, and the state. 
And it made me change my mind about a lot of literature on how the open market is much more important for innovation than the sheltered market. Or to, th to come to believe that the US American technological power comes from having a very big sheltered market and a very big open market. When you look at the literature on how Japan was overtaking us and was going to be the 21st century Pacific power back in the 80s, a lot of it had to do with Japan taking our technologies like the VCR and learning how to sell them uh, to the public. Uh, but that really disappeared right around 1979-80 when, Bill jo uh, when um, Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates got going with the PC and Microsoft software and, and Apple computer, which I still swear by. It's a wonderful firm, and I can't wait to get my hands on an iPad. <laughs> I, I have a, some criticism of George W. Bush, but we've all heard that so many times that I'm going to go over it, Let me uh, or skip it. Let me just say that I did not write this book with George Bush in my mind. I started it before Bush became president uh, and did not really want my book to be <coughs> like so many books on international affairs are in the last decade to whatever one thinks of George Bush's um, policies. But he did revive classic tendencies in America's relationship to the world that are associated with a Pacific or a West-facing uh, American policy, and that's unilateralism, uh, not paying much attention to uh, allies, high uh, displays of nationalism and patriotism, that sort of thing. Let me end there because uh, that's what I didn't talk about. That's the California that uh, is part of California dreaming and was part of my California dreaming when I was a teenager. I wanted to sit right in the back seat of that Mercury with my girlfriend, uh, but I wasn't living in California. Uh, but I, I do think that that's another element of California's power uh, is really the pioneering of not mass production, because Henry Ford did that, but of mass consumption. Uh, California had uh, more cars per capita by 1929 than France had uh, in 1980. Uh, it had more cars per capita than most other uh, places in the country. So uh, the highway lifestyle, uh, getting, getting around in a car with freeways, living in suburbs, was pioneered in the 1920s, and I didn't really know this or the degree to which it was true until I did this research, but I, I think that it's just another element of the way in which California joined the union and then ended up transforming uh, the country uh, uh, itself. So I, I think I stuck to 45 minutes and I'm gonna stop there, but I'll leave this up for your edification. Thank you very much for your attention. Bruce, just to get the discussion going, uh, can you tell us how you would describe your own approach to history as a result of writing this book? I mean it in the sense that it's really quite different uh, from what we would call the old-fashioned diplomatic history based on foreign relations. Uh, it's much more than that. It's demographic, it's culture, and it's following the chronological developments in Asia as well as in the United States. But I'm, I'm, uh, I think this would be interesting to hear how you would define your own approach in relation to the established disciplines. Well, I uh, was trained in political science and went into the archives uh, for the same reason that uh, Willie Sutton went to banks. <laughs> I just felt the ar information was the best in the archives. And I came out the other end as an historian, at least according to most political scientists. Uh, and, and that I, uh, never has bothered me. I mean, I took a history cl curriculum along with political science at, at Columbia. This book uh, is not based in primary sources. It's based in the work of, of generations of historians who did use primary sources. I mean, there's some primary sources in it. But what I did was read uh, really seven or 800 books that represent the best scholarship on the American West and America and the Pacific, and tried to pick out of it what I thought was, was important. And I think the, the best thing one can say for my method uh, is that I was like a kid in a candy shop reading this stuff because it's not my field. And so I brought a different perspective on the history of the American West, I think, than a Western historian would. And then with regard to the Pacific, as I said earlier, I, I saw things coming at me from the United States from the standpoint of, of Northeast Asia for much of my career. 
and tried to puzzle out why American policy in that region, I thought, was so flawed compared to our policy in East Asia. I mean, obviously, uh, I got going with this uh, because of my concerns about uh, the failed war in, in Vietnam. But in, in the course of doing my earlier work, which was in, uh, my first three books were entirely based on primary sources, I came to realize that American diplomacy, uh, done by its best practitioners like uh, George Kennan or Acheson, requires knowledge of a lot of different fields because that's the knowledge they had. Uh, when you take a guy like John J. McCloy, who came out of uh, uh, lo lawyering for the oil industry and the Rockefellers, you have a person who already has a pretty fully formed worldview by the time he's an important official in the Second World War, and I felt that I needed to understand that, and it led me into political economy rather than history uh, or just politics in understanding uh, the origins of the Korean War, the development of South and North Korea, Japan, and so on uh, in more recent decades. And so I think, from my standpoint, my method is the method I've followed in much of my career since it finally dawned on me that the disciplinary distinctions that we think are so important mean nothing to an Atchison. They mean nothing to him. And so I needed to get inside his head and figure out how he looked at the world. And then when you take that sort of perspective and look at, at what historians write, I think you, you know, I hope maybe I, I have some uh, insights that wouldn't have occurred to, to them. So that's about the best I can say I, for this method. Thanks. Uh, could we ask people to identify themselves as they ask questions, Don? Yeah, Don Wolfensperger with the Wilson Center here. Enjoyed your presentation very much. I am not a historian either and enjoyed some history courses undergrad, but I'm just wondering whether you had uh, occasion to reconsider sort of a I don't want to say revisionist, but a renewed look at Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, frontier theory of Ameri American character and history and so on, because there's just so much running throughout your piece there about how, even though we ran up against the coast there, we were continuing to innovate and find new creative ways to expand our spirit, our economy, whatever. But, I mean, did you have a chance to reflect on this any further? Well, uh, I, I read just about everything that Turner wrote for this book, and I was surprised that primary sources and Frederick Jackson Turner were, you know, strangers. Uh, much of his work is, in, is entirely interpretive, uh, and yet a lot of it is, is fascinating just because his own deep ideals about American democracy and how it was founded on the frontier uh, and became a model uh, for what America should look like ran hard up against uh, especially Chicago and the Midwest and the rise of, of the industrial combine of, of steel and coal and railways in his own lifetime. And I think what I believe is that he got into a mode that is rather typical in our country. When your dreams are dashed, you know, you take it and you re reconsider, and then you go on with your dreams and your ideals. Uh, William Appleman Williams, strangely enough, uh, as a radical historian, I think had a lot of that in, in, in his own work, that he thought the problem with the U.S. was not living up to its ideals rather than a materialist explanation of the American empire or something. But what is amazing about Turner is he's an optimist right to the end. And one of the great quotes that I, I found uh, has him in California living in Pasadena in the 1920s in retirement, drinking three glasses of fresh orange juice every day and saying how wonderful the water and power works are that they've been doing, which show the spirit of the frontier realized in um, you know Hoover Dam and all of this. And so what I say is basically he could take his theory and explain pretty much anything that he liked. Uh, but I, I, I do think that probably Leo Marx's idea is closer to the truth uh, uh, about basic themes in, in American history than, than Turner was. Yes. Uh, Sarah Friedman, Indiana University and the Wilson Center. I was struck in your presentation by an interesting comment you had about the Korean War as a um, interruption in a process that was already ongoing in U.S. engagement in Asia. And I was also struck in your presentation by the absence of any mention of the Cold War and of the Soviet Union. And I'm wondering how that fits into this picture that you're telling us here of expansion westward continuing on into the Pacific. Well, when you look at uh, captured North Korean documents that the archives has by the thousands of boxes 
what the North Koreans thought they were doing when they attacked in June 1950 was to smash uh, the revival of Japanese militarism and, and industry and its connections to South Korea. The connections were incipient in terms of economic, post-war economic activity, but very direct in terms of the high command of the South Korean army, which was all trained in Japanese military academies. Uh, and, and so from the North Korean standpoint, this was a nationalist attempt on their part to smash uh, what Atchison would have called the Great Crescent. Now, I don't think I've convinced anybody that I'm right, but I know I'm right because I read those materials. And they're internal materials. They're for the Army officers and the cadres of the party. They're not for public consumption. Uh, so they tried to shut down uh, the regional export-led development program that was already starting in the late 40s, and they failed. And they've paid the price for it for the last 30 years or so in, in terms of the rundown of their own economy and the catastrophes that have happened to their own people uh, by virtue of not opening up. But I think it's a very important story, and I, I think ev eventually people will agree with me. Now you really <laughs> were very shrewd in saying, where did the Cold War and the Soviet Union go? Because what I think is that we were in a parenthesis in history from 1941 to 1991 where we were forced by virtue of World War II and the Cold War to be very close to Europe, NATO, England, uh, all of that. And that it's been fraying slowly, uh, rather rapidly it seemed, with Don Rumsfeld and old Europe and things like that in the, in the Bush administration, fraying rather slowly. But I think, I think that we are no longer in the kind of Atlanticist relationship <coughs> that defined our foreign policy from 1941 to 91. And uh, whether I'm right or wrong about this really requires uh, quite a bit more time to go by. Uh, but it seems to me that the Bush administration tendencies were entirely predictable uh, of a, an estrangement with Europe, very sharp European uh, opposition to the Iraq war. Uh, they weren't predictable in the form they took, the, but they were predictable uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. What I would have also predicted is that unified Germany would have been much more powerful than it is 20 years later, uh, but that may happen in the future. Uh, Germany doesn't deploy the weight that I would have thought it would, uh, but I, I, really, I really see this book as looking at the Cold War and the Soviet Union itself as a period in history that has come and gone. Um, I had one question, but now that you've just said that, I have a second question. My first question is, if you were to take that Saul Steinberg cartoon and reverse it, what, what would the view of the U.S. be like from Tokyo, from Seoul? You know, what, 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 do, they, what do they think of us, and how do they put us well, in, into their history? I, I think when you look at, uh, you have to look at different uh, perspectives. Uh, for much of the last 20 years, as Korea democratized, uh, there's been a great deal of criticism of the United States, and many of the democratic figures who uh, fought against the dictatorship also saw th thought they were fighting against the United States who was supporting the dictatorship. And so you get a president like Noh Moo Hyun uh, from 2003 uh, to 08, uh, who you know, wants to uh, have an independent South Korean army, wants to get the huge Yongsan military base out of Seoul, and that causes enormous friction with the United States. Uh, now the Korean president uh, is a different one and is really back in the kind of mold that most Korean presidents have been in uh, back in the 80s and before. With Tokyo, uh, with the new government, you also see them raising new issues about our, uh, particularly our occupation of Okinawa, which is remarkable. If you go there, I went there and interviewed military officers, including a woman who was uh, in her 50s who commanded uh, one of the uh, bases there. It's a fascinating interview. And I very much admire the people uh, that are there and all of that, but I said, what are you doing here 60 years after World War II? And she said, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I said, it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, no one would have predicted that. Uh, so I don't know how far the Hatoyama government is going to do in challenging this, but I, I think there is an increasing awareness of uh, an anachronism in our presence, especially our military-based presence in, in East Asia. Uh, although I don't think the Pentagon wants to reduce, I think it would rather ramp up uh, because of worries about China. But if you actually take the Steinberg cartoon, I don't care whether you're in Japan or Korea or Los Angeles, I think what you would see is New York City and Washington 
towering in the distance because that's where the power is, whether it's political or financial or commercial or cultural, not commercial, uh, cultural. Uh, I still think they feel that they're in the shadow of the East Coast of the United States because they are. You don't think L.A. looms large in the cultural sphere? I think it does if you're talking about Hollywood. Mm. Uh, that's a very old story, though. It goes back to birth of a nation in 1915 uh, when the industry was really founded and got millions of Americans going to the movies every weekend. Uh, that's an un unbelievable uh, element of American domination of world popular culture. Uh, I was in Taipei for a conference in 2006, and I counted all the theaters that were playing Chinese movies as opposed to what I would see at my local 16-plex mall. And, and it was about 95% American and Hollywood movies. And that's true all over the world. We, we have a popular, cultural, popular culture template here that is used all over the world. A and that's a huge part of our influence. Uh, but it's not, I mean, it, it, it's located in LA. It's a very important part of, of Southern California. Uh, but it still doesn't have the power of, of a president uh, or uh, the head of uh, Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. something like that. But my second question sort of builds on your response to Sarah, and that is you're suggesting that the U.S. is move, shifting from west, from an eastern ori orientation toward the east, toward Europe, to the west, but is that the only alternative? In other words, is, is it a bipolar world, or are we heading toward a multipolar world? I just think the, the unilateralist and nationalist and go-it-alone tendencies uh, of, of the west-facing thrust of the United States uh, are are popular with a lot of Americans now in a way that they weren't during the Cold War. Our relations with our allies like Japan and South Korea in, in uh, East Asia still partake of a big brother, little brother phenomenon where we, we get surprised when they talk back to us. This was very much true of Nomu Hyun. And the Washington Post had a remarkable editorial about Japan just a couple weeks ago, essentially saying, who are these people that tell us what to do? We're providing for their defense, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't think that's a big tendency but in, in Japan and Korea, but I do think George Bush did something that might have happened anyway, which is to take the kind of unilateralism that I think characterizes uh, our policies in the Pacific more than it does in the Atlantic, uh, and turn them around as, as global policies, except where Europe is concerned. I mean, Europe still has a, its own special place, uh, I think, because of cultural ties that don't really uh, exist between us and China or us and Japan and Korea. That's, that's a big generalization, but I try to, I try to back it up in the book. Ken McDonald. Uh, yeah, I just have, sorry, I'm getting there. This is more a comment than a question, but I noted when you spoke of our great worldwide base structure, which is really is quite astonishing. Uh, and an interesting phenomenon to analyze. But you said we have bases in every big industrial country. I'm not sure how you, endure, uh, how you would define big, but in investing, when you talk about the, in the last year or so, the most rapidly developing uh, places to in invest are BRIC, uh, right. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And as you say, we have no bases in China. Mm -hmm. We have no bases also in Russia, which, is in a bad patch now, but for right. 40 years of the Cold War, we considered a major industrial power. I'm just curious what your take is on this. Well, you're right. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, what my answer would my answer would be that uh, if you look at the top uh, six or seven or eight uh, industrial powers, uh, China is the only one besides France that is in there that uh, doesn't have American military bases. In other words. Well, Russia is, is uh, not in the top seven or eight. Russia is about where South Korea is, maybe a little ahead of it in terms of its G, uh, GDP. Uh, if you take the classic countries of the balance of power in, in Europe, uh, Germany, England, France, and Italy, not so much Italy, uh, you know, we have bases uh, on all their territory except France. Now, what I thought you might also ask is whether, what difference does this make? I mean, the Philippines told us to go home. And we went home. Uh, I think that has something to do with Mount Pinatubo uh, blowing up and inundating Clark Air Force Base. But I mean, that's what people in Okinawa said to me, the officers I interviewed. They said, we'll go home as soon as the Japanese tell us to go home. We're here at their sufferance. Uh, 
And uh, I don't know what I think about that. I guess I think that uh, I'll probably be dead before that ever happens in Japan. And I don't hope to die in the next 10 years or so. Uh, if I live to be my mother's age, who's 95, I still don't think I'll see Japan asking us to go home, or England, or Germany. But I think when they do ask us to go home, that'll be a real watershed in the post-war world order. Then we will see what independent Japan and independent Germany, fully independent countries, what they look like and how they behave. I, I think it's a very important point. Maybe that, they don't want to find out. Uh, that's another reason why they're not asking us to go home. Uh, Joey Long and then David Nichols. Uh, Joey Long. Um, I was wondering, as, as America moves west, I mean, to what extent does the empire by invitation kind of thesis applies in Asia? Uh, as especially in contemporary politics uh, with the rise of China and the fear uh, among Southeast Asians, for example, about what the rise of China might pose uh, to the security architecture in Asia Pacific and how the uh, Southeast Asians might see the United States as a balancer of uh, Chinese power. So to what extent does that apply, uh, the Empire by Invitation thesis? Well, I, I don't think it applies much before World War II. We had to fight a three-year guerrilla war uh, in the Philippines before uh, we established our colony there. Uh, McKinley uh, and, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt and others who were involved in those decisions were, frankly, imperialist, particularly Roosevelt. Polk, I think, did exactly what he said he was going to do when he campaigned for the presidency and, and wasn't concerned about whether the Mexicans were going to invite us uh, to take California or not. Uh, in, in the post-war period, I think there is something to be said for empire by invitation, uh, in, in part for reasons we just discussed. Uh, Japan would have to spend a lot more than 1% of its GNP on defense if we weren't there. Uh, it would have to respond to North Korean nuclear weapons if we weren't there. Same is true of South Korea. Uh, I think in both cases, the base structure and our policies came out of war, World War II and Korea. Uh, but once you live with them for quite a while, something like an empire by invitation uh, is part of it. Uh, I think that we're being invited too much on the circumference of China. We have too many invitations in Afghanistan uh, in particular, uh, and maybe Southeast Asia as, as, as time develops. But yeah, there, there's something to be said for that. I think, uh, I think radical critics make a big mistake in seeing the American empire as if it's just another empire like pre-World War II empires. I think that it's just completely wrong. When you look at what Chinese scholars write about the open door and the open door policy, they, they see the US as a different power than England or Germany or France were biting off pieces of Chinese territory 100 years ago. And I think they're right, because the US uh, and, and its leaders thought a colony was another name for a self-contained political economy, and what we wanted was openness, because we could compete with anybody. And that gives you a different position in the world than if you need a yen block or a franc block or something like that in order to protect your uh, industries uh, and goods. So, you know, I'll, I'll st I still think we have this archipelago of empire, but I, I don't think we operate like empires of the past. And all this stuff about Rome, and Rome is going to be the example of our decline and just ridiculous, uh, but you see it all the time. <coughs> I have a. If I stepped on anybody's toes, David but Nichols. yeah. David Nichols, um, I have a question um, related to that about um, the perception I think among some, particularly some of the ASEAN countries who are maybe more skeptical about a Sinocentric world that. Um, in the last 10 years, because the U.S. has been so focused on the Middle East, that we really haven't been courting ASEAN very much. The Chinese have been engaged in effective diplomacy, according to some, I, who might feel that the U.S. hasn't been. Um, I was wondering if you could, because in some ways that seems to run a bit counter to some of the thrust of what you're saying about the U.S. moving into the Pacific. So I, how, is this a blip, or is this? No, actually, I, I mean, I would argue that you're right, that the Bush administration uh, and so far, the Obama administration hasn't paid a lot of attention to East and Southeast Asia. Uh, we got off to a bit of a rocky start with the uh, incident on April Fool's Day in 2000, uh, where uh, our spy jet was shot down. But basically, the Iraq war put China on the back burner, so China could double its industrial production during the Bush administration. Uh, and uh, ASEAN and diplomacy in general were abjured 
it took the Chinese to get the six-party talks going uh, for North Korea, and that was primarily a venue to get the U.S. and North Korea talking together. The Bush administration didn't, didn't want to talk to the uh, elements of the axis of evil. So I, I do think there was a kind of classic American downplaying of diplomacy, including with our European allies, uh, during at least the first five or six years of the Bush administration. And that would have been predictable from, from what I have been saying. On the other hand, uh, China has exercised a very uh, forward diplomacy in, in the best possible way. I mean, they have tried to uh, make themselves useful in, in, in line with their slogans about peaceful development and haven't stepped on toes and have been good, a good neighbor. And I, uh, as an historian, hope that continues because that's essentially uh, what China's position was hundreds of years ago, at least in regard to Northeast Asia, if not Vietnam or Indochina, a good neighbor. Uh, David Kong has a very nice new book uh, essentially arguing that an East Asian international political system is different than the East Asian political system that we are used to of realpolitik and all of that, and, and so far he's right about China. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul Foreman, uh, Smithsonian Museum of American History. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, Leo Marx. Uh, seems to play uh, a large role uh, in your thinking. Uh, you uh, emphasized him um, more than any other in your presentation and also in the question period. And I have a hard time uh, grasping uh, what his meaning could be uh, for you. That is to say, uh, your, your considerations here, uh, mainly in the realm of, if not uh, realpolitik in, in the realm of real uh, politics, real international relations, real power factors. And uh, Leo Marx, um, <coughs> The Machine in the Garden, uh, published in 64. Uh, this was not the work of a historian, uh, but uh, someone out of the uh, American studies tradition as it used to be. Uh, that is before postmodernized, uh, when it was still really a branch of um, uh, literary studies, uh, uh, giving expression to uh, a very old-fashioned uh, cultural elitist romanticism uh, in which he uh, sought to distinguish uh, the uh, uh, techno-enthusiasm of the uh, uh, American populace uh, from uh, the uh, rom romantic uh, anti-technological uh, attitudes of the uh, elite, uh, cultural elite writers, uh, Hawthorne and, and so on. Um, uh, a proposition which, uh, by the way, subsequent research has shown to be indefensible. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I don't understand uh, what uh, its meaning and utility is uh, for uh, your uh, general view of uh, political economy and <coughs> world affairs? Well, that's a very, very good question. And I just recently sent a copy of my book to Leo Marx. I, I don't know the man, but John Dower uh, told me he still comes into MIT and he'd love to see a copy of my book. So I sent him a copy of my book, but I, I haven't heard from him yet. And now I'm kind of <laughs> worried about hearing from him. <laughs> Uh, after your question. Uh, I, the chapter I had the most trouble with and never, in my view, got right with is chapter one in the book. It, it's, uh, it's about the machine in the garden and Leo Marx and all of that. And I tried to argue that his theme uh, of the techno superiority and techno fetishes of, of the American people combined with the high culture and, and the romantic reaction to that in the form of Thoreau and various other people is really a fundamental theme of the peopling and population uh, going all the way to the West until you get to California, where the theme continues today. Uh, and so I traced it with the rise of Chicago and Turner and the way that, that the industrial machine in the Midwest made Turner uh, 
question his own frontier hypotheses. Uh, and then I take it to, uh, above all, California, where they're still talking about Noah Cross or, you know, Mulholland and these people and, and the water and power uh, discourse or the realtors who <coughs> desecrated the landscape and got rid of the beautiful orange groves or the highways that did the same thing and the automobile that fouled the beautiful air. I mean, it goes on and on, and Mike Davis is just the footnote. Uh, he says the same thing in a different way in every one of his books about California, that California has been done under by capitalism or by industrialists or by this federal government. And I actually think Southern California is one of the garden spots on the face of the earth, and I, I love to go there. And even though Los Angeles has been paved over, there's no question about that, uh, there are lots of wonderful places there. But I, what I see in Leo Marx's book is a theme that continued across the continent uh, and, and is alive and well in California. And then the, if you ask uh, Americans who are, think about our position in the world, what does the U.S. stand for? They will say freedom and democracy and uh, anti-terrorism or anti-communism during the Cold War. Uh, and uh, everybody our views, are, our ideals, and our values, and our truths are self-evident. And then you say, what about the archipelago of military bases that's never the world has never seen before? That's a machine for the American global garden. And that, that's the least effective, I think, of my <laughs> links back to Leo Marx, but it nonetheless you know, follows on uh, that Americans tend to think of themselves, I th think of myself and as an American and my country, in ideal terms. Uh, and uh, it, it takes some reflection or some reminders uh, uh, to remember that we 60% of the territory of Okinawa is occupied by American military bases. Uh, there are several I'm people sorry, I'd like to sorry. bring into this discussion. David Painter is an economic historian. Ted Kiefer, from his perspective of the uh, foreign relations of the United States. Leslie Bissell, from the perspective of Brazil. Uh, Sam Wells, from the world in general. Uh, while they're thinking about it, a uh, question back here. Uh, Terry Louts, nice to see you, Bruce. Uh, you're talking mainly about the westward push of the Euro-Americans. I'm wondering, to uh, if, if the eastern push of Asians coming to California figures in, uh, in your research and your study. It was a, a hot issue in the late 19th century, of course, uh, a, th a threat to labor. You know, this is where the yellow peril literature all, all starts. So how does that figure into the, the paradigm? Well, it, it figures in in that I am going to have to redo this slideshow because this is the second time I've done this, and both times I've forgotten to put in a slide about an entire chapter in my book, uh, which is the uh, Eastering of a Asians. Now, in the Western history profession, there's a term called Westering, the Westering of the American people. No one quite knows where it came from, but I talk about the Eastering of Asians. Uh, Chinese got here with the gold rush and uh, are pioneers just as surely as anybody else uh, from the 1850s onward, the railroads and California agriculture. Uh, and it's, I think, the saddest chapter in the book because until the mid-60s and the civil rights movement, Asians in the West were treated in a Jim Crow fashion. <coughs> it wasn't as bad as in the South, but they sat in balconies in theaters. They, so did Mexicans. They swam in the pools the day before they were cleaned. Uh, they were limited to Chinatowns and Japantowns because of housing restrictions until the 60s. Uh, and in the late 19th century, they were lynched and murdered uh, pretty much with impunity or just banished from entire towns along the West Coast. So it, it's not a happy story, but I try to argue that until we as a people come to respect those to the West of us, the same way that we respect French or Germans or the British, uh, we're going to have a tough time uh, because we're no longer dealing with Indian tribes that can be pushed aside militarily. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the re revival of one of the great civilizations in the world with uh, nuclear power at its fingertips. So uh, I, uh, my fondest hope for the 21st century is that the peopling of the United States by people of color, Asian Americans and others, uh, will be in, in, in a race with changing attitudes so that, that the Pacific actually can become a mutually uh, beneficial civilization rather than the arena for another war. So it's a very important part, and I, uh, some sort of Freudian reason, I guess, why I didn't include it, include it in this presentation. <laughs> 
it always struck me when people talk about the American military bases around the world that in almost every American military base overseas I've ever visited, they try to recreate uh, American suburbia. Uh, and part of that's part of the machine in the guard. Is that the case? I haven't been to bases in Asia. Uh, but there was also a phenomena, visited bases in Germany before, say, in the late 60s, then later, and uh, struck uh, by the fact that in the 50s and 60s, the American base was the most affluent island in these areas, and after the 70s, it was less affluent than the surroundings. Is that the case in other places? Well, it's nice to see you, David. I haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, yes, it is, but it was much more pronounced in the 60s when, and 50s. Uh, it, w it was a, a really a part of my growing up uh, to be in the Peace Corps, living in the Korean economy with a family, and uh, to go up to the Itaewon section where not only the military people, but embassy and AID and other folks lived in, in suburban homes and two-car garages, and Koreans couldn't get in there without a pass, but I could walk right onto the base and get a cheeseburger uh, because I looked like I might be a soldier uh, in, in civvies. So that, that really was uh, uh, a very important, uh, fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know, uh, aspect of, of how I came to understand American power as a young man uh, in Korea. In the, in the case uh, today, uh, it, it, I mean, I have to say I was struck in, in visiting Okinawa to see the degree to which two military slash civilian cultures competed. One was the 50s, so that right across from um, one of the major bases was a McDonald's with a jukebox playing Little Richard and the Deltones and, you know, you name it from the 50s, uh, and the other popular culture that was recuperated there was 80s hip hop, for the black, mainly for the black soldiers. So you have a lot of NBA stuff, a lot of hip hop stuff in the stores along the, uh, the Ville near the base, but very little evidence of much interaction between American soldiers, uh, folks on the base, and, and uh, the locals. And that, I, I think, is much better today in Okinawa than it used to be. Uh, I do think the military in Okinawa, the American military, is bent over backward to try and uh, understand uh, the local community and what it wants uh, after some pretty horrendous things have happened, especially uh, in, in the mid-90s. Uh, but the fact remains that, that uh, these are n nostalgic uh, recuperations of, of a 50s or 60s Midwestern culture, and uh, I think for uh, Hispanics and uh, black soldiers, maybe 80s culture. Uh, I, uh, I visited Panmunjom for the umpteenth time. I've been there guided by North Koreans, South Koreans, and, and this time I was guided by the U.S. Army. And I was served uh, a lunch of uh, chicken fried steak and french fries with a poster on the wall from one of Hank Williams' last concerts. Now, Hank Williams died in 1952 or three. So, uh, and I think that there's a certain tendency uh, of people in the military to to be much more comfortable th with that than with than with the culture that we live in in the United States every day. I, I have to say, though, I don't know much about it. I mean, I've only been on military bases maybe 15 times in my life, and people who, who have been there for years may have a different uh, a different view. There's a, there's a whole host of that. I, I, it's worth mentioning that many of the Protestant missionaries who went to uh, China, Japan, Korea in the 19th century, early 20th century, did exactly the same thing. They lived in compounds, and they replicated yeah. their their middle-class American values and lives. They ate Western food. They didn't eat Chinese food, even though they had Chinese servants. So th there's a long tradition. They lived better than the military. Uh, and if you look at, um, Blanking on the name Underwood, the Underwood family in Korea, which is an old missionary family, they're, they're one of the Underwood homes is, is just as you come into one entrance to Yonsei University, which they helped to found. And it's, it's a typical brick, uh, middle class American structure. And I used to see uh, a friend of mine was down in Taechun Beach uh, teaching English, and I'd go down there to see him when we see the missionaries with their speedboats going by uh, back in the late 60s. So, yeah, it, it, it's true. I, I, also, I mean, what could you expect them to live on in the 50s or during the Korean War? I mean, when the country was completely torn apart, it's not, not that surprising. But it does give off a colonial uh, aura.
Uh, Bruce, we need to bring, uh, begin bringing this to a close. Would you mind if we collect a few uh, no, comments and questions, and then we will uh, let you comment in the end. Leslie? Well, simply to say you, you're thinking of um, the United States looking west, and I, I tend to look north, south, and south, north, so I work on Brazil. Roger invited me to say something. The only thing I could say briefly is, of course, Brazil is the eighth largest c economy in the world, expected to become the sixth or even the fifth in the next 20 years, and there are no military bases right. uh, in Brazil either. And uh, Brazil is also, of course, the only other American country, continental-sized country, which had an expansion westwards. It had a similar experience to the United States, but of course it could never reach the Pacific. Uh, it reached the Andes and it reached its Spanish-American neighbors and didn't like what it saw and didn't want anything to do with its Spanish-American neighbors because Brazil doesn't think it's part of anything to do with Spanish America or Latin America. So it turned its back on those until quite recently. And now Brazil does have a Western push, but it still comes up against its Spanish-American neighbors. And the difference again, I suppose, is that um, Whereas the whole of Spanish America has a real problem with the United States because of the historical baggage of the Mexican War and the Spanish War and the occupation of Cuba, Brazil never had any of that baggage and never had any problem with the United States until now. And now, for the first time, as Brazil begins to flex its muscles and thinks that it's some kind of regional and global power, Brazil is now challenging the hegemony of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, but it still can't look beyond the Andes, and it can't have any kind of Pacific dimension. But it's the only other country in the Americas which has, in some ways, similar, not just slavery, but this frontier problem and this push to the West. It's, it, this is related, I think, I'm sorry, Tom Dell. Um, this is related, I think, to the first question you got that I didn't really think you gave an answer, and that was Cold War and USSR, not just Korea. Right. And I think perhaps what did the USSR do to influence North Korea? Okay. I think you kind of stopped at the justification that North Koreans gave to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question I have is I'd be very interested from your research. I think many of your comments have been, it, there's a sense of an in, some type of internal design or strategy emanating from the U.S. What has been those themes that you have seen the U.S. reacting to across the Pacific? If they could be threats, they could be opportunities, not just opportunities, but um, instead of a master design emanating from the West Coast out, what type of reaction is occurring here? Is there a last question or comment? Well, it's a good way. Uh, well, let me move backward through these uh, excellent questions. Uh, I, I don't, in the book, and I, I may have get, given that impression today, but I, I don't see any master design. I, I see tendencies in the westward movement that, that are different than uh, an Atlanticist or Euro, uh, European-oriented uh, American relationship to the world. Uh, what surprised me, and I, I should have known this, in, in regard to the second point you made, what were they doing that attracted our attention out there? Uh, I was less aware than I should have been of, of the formidability of the Japanese Navy and the degree to which it, it challenged the U.S. really from the time it had a formidable Navy after the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, the Naniwa, it was a great warship, is parked right off of Honolulu uh, in 1898, right at the time of the annexation of, of Hawaii. And then you have a, a, a rivalry that continues uh, down to Pearl Harbor. But what surprised me is the U.S. did so little uh, to build up Pearl Harbor until about 1939 when the war opened in Europe. I mean, they dredged uh, channels and they, they made some movement before World War I, but then in World War I, uh, all of the Pacific uh, Army was thrown into the war in Europe. And by the time they got back, Pearl Harbor was overgrown, some of the things they had done to improve the port and not much happened in the 20s either. This is really Roosevelt, the Navy man, who, who first gives Pearl Harbor its centrality in the Pacific. And of course, I mean, what would the Japanese think of that? Uh, obviously, you know, they, they had been used to a, a rivalry, but one in which, you know, there weren't many clashes. Uh, 
in the 20s, uh, Japan, uh, and well, from 1902 onward, Japan was a kind of secret uh, uh, partner of the U.S. in the, in the Anglo-Japanese uh, alliance. So th that was something I, I hadn't sufficiently been aware of, and, and I, so I wrote it up as best I could in the book to, to show the degree to which uh, there was a kind of Cold War developing, especially in the 30s between the U.S. and Japan. As for uh, the Soviet Union and, and North Korea, I mean, the, the, there's no question that uh, the Soviets supported the, the invasion. What I w was getting at is, and, and they may have supported what the North Koreans were talking about in their internal materials, too. George Kennan uh, wrote in his memoirs that he thought uh, the North Korean attack sponsored by the Soviets happened because of what we were doing in Japan. Uh, he was very aware of that because he went out to Japan in 1948 and had big arguments with MacArthur about reviving heavy industry in Japan. And I, I have always thought that he may have had intelligence that I've never seen or that w is unavailable uh, until perhaps recently uh, behind that remark. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Stalin, I don't think, would have uh, started that war if he thought the U.S. was going to get involved in a big way and, and it might lead to war with the Soviet Union, as it appeared might happen in, in the fall, late fall of winter of 1950. But anyway, uh, your point is well taken. It's just that everybody now, I think, because of the post-Soviet document, sees that. But what they still don't see is that North Korea doesn't start a war because Joe Stalin says it wants a war. North Korea starts a war because it wants a war and was successful in getting backing uh, from the Soviet Union and China for that. Um, I'm about to move to Brazil. Uh, there are two countries that I really thought a lot about when I looked at the map of, the, uh, of this hemisphere, and those are Brazil and Canada. Uh, I think global warming is going to defeat my hypothesis about the U.S. being the only country with long Atlantic and Pacific coasts, because Canada has even longer Atlantic and Pacific coasts. They're just not very useful, uh, except in Vancouver and, and uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and all of that, beca because of the climate. And then Brazil uh, did push into the interior. It is a continental country. It's exactly uh, what you say it is, a country that, that never gave the U.S. Much of, much of a problem because of its Portuguese heritage and uh, never having been occupied uh, or in a war or anything like that. And the BRIC countries, as you can tell from my response to this gentleman here, uh, are ones that uh, came up while I was working on this book as, as some, you know, like the Knicks. Suddenly we have the BRICs and people are, are talking about them. I didn't know Brazil was the eighth largest economy, uh, but it, it's been about where South Korea has been, and Korea is the tenth or eleventh largest economy. Uh, they sort of compete back and forth. Uh, since the 60s uh, for development, but it's a continental country. Uh, South Korea isn't. China and Russia also are continental countries. And you see Stalin uh, reading books on the gold rush to figure out how to populate Siberia yes. the way California was populated. Uh, but Siberia is also under a tundra. And uh, Vladivostok is, is uh, you know, their best effort on, on their Pacific coast. China uh, is a continental country, very similar in size to the U.S., but its, its western part opens up into the desert and the steppes. And so it's a curiosity that of all five countries named, the, the only one who ha manages to beat its way to a, a major new coastline is, is the U.S. Bruce, we want to thank you for a most stimulating, interesting, original